Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is November 5th, 2022, and this is the fifth part of my series called The Obedience of Faith. Today we're going to um, get into Romans chapter 7 and chapter 8. Before I get to Romans, I want to talk to you a little bit about the nature of scripture and why the scripture is written the way it is and what it is. <clears throat> have you ever considered why do we even have a Bible? What's the purpose for the Bible and who was the Bible written for? The first answer is that the Bible is it contains the testimony concerning God. The testimony concerning God, the testimony concerning Jesus, the Christ, who was God in the flesh, who died for our sins. So it's written by people who were witnesses of the workings of God, both before Jesus came into the flesh 2,000 years ago and then also by those who knew him when he walked in the flesh 2,000 years ago and by people who heard the testimony of those who had walked with Jesus. So the Bible is the testimony of God written by witnesses of God's working in the world and in their lives specifically. <clears throat> Second, why is it or why was it written? It was written for his children. It was written for his sons. It was written so that they could learn to become like their father. Once you understand this, it helps to understand a lot of the scriptures that seem so hard to understand. For example, why does almost everyone, every Christian teach that people who do not accept God, do not accept Jesus as their Savior, will burn forever in eternal torment, in an eternal hell of fire. The reason they teach that is because there are scriptures that seem to say that, but they don't but people do not take into account all of the scriptures. We, we have to take all of the word of God into account for us to understand what the scriptures really talk about. Now the reason I'm doing this particular study is for those people who have been called to be children of God but are still having difficulty in walking a life of obedience and a, walk, a life of faith. Let's quickly look at John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Then, skipping down to verse 9, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, 
He gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man, but of God. Notice in verse 12, to all who did receive him, speaking of Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. It doesn't say that he made them children of God right then. He gave them the right to become. What? So if you have believed in the name of Jesus, if you have believed in Jesus, you have the right to become a child of God. Now the question is, are you becoming a child of God? Now this is why in the scripture you have this controversy about the idea of have you been saved or are you being saved? It's dealing with two separate things. We all are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. But the question is, are we being saved? Which is talking of that first salvation deals with your spirit. So all the spirits of men will be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. But the next part, the idea of being saved, is dealing with our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions. Are we being conformed into the image of Christ, into the image of God? That's what it takes to become a son of God. And that's why the Bible was written, so that we would understand what that means and what that entails. And since the Bible is the actual word of God put into print, we are to wash ourselves with the word we are to take the word, the written word, into our hearts. We are to renew our minds with the word of God. A couple more verses before we get to Romans. Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. I read this parable last time. And it's about being invited to the wedding feast. This is talking about the marriage of the Lamb. And the last three verses, four verses of this says, But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The man had no wedding garment because he had not saved his soul. He hadn't washed with the word. He was not prepared to go into the wedding. And so because of that, he's cast into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is hell. That is, technically that's not hell. That's the lake of fire. That's where you are going to learn to obey God. But it, this parable ends with verse 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. Who are the many? Everyone. Everyone is called, but few are chosen. Okay. Really, everyone is called? Everyone is saved, you say? They're spirits? Yes, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. 
We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Yeah, because you give up everything to follow Christ. That's why he said that. His life was not his own. He spent his life following Christ and obeying Christ and suffering for Christ. Verse 20, 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The first fruits of those who died in the flesh. That's what that means. For as by a man came death, who is that? Adam. By Adam came death, by a man, Jesus, has come also the resurrection of the dead. Then verse 22, for as in Adam all die, who dies in Adam? Everyone. We all die in Adam. All of us, all of our spirits died in Adam. Because that's what died in Adam on the day that he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the day you shall eat, you shall surely die. So Adam's spirit died on that day. For as in Adam all die, and then we partake of that death by being of the flesh like Adam was, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Now did the definition of all change it within this verse? Does all in Adam dying mean that only a few who confess Christ will be made alive? No, it doesn't say a few will be made alive. It says all will be made alive. Now, just there is a good scripture to help to prove this point. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So his body died, but he was made alive in the spirit. Verse 19, in which, that means in his spirit, he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. So Peter says, and he says this obviously by uh, revelation of the Holy Spirit, Jesus went and proclaimed the gospel. He, he proclaimed himself to the spirits who were in prison. So a dead spirit obviously s still exists, but it's in prison. What? The prison of death. So it's in prison. Jesus goes, preaches to them. And then another verse says he led captivity captive. Now, I don't believe that these were the only spirits that Jesus went and preached to. I think Peter said this by revelation, but Jesus went and preached to all the spirits who were in prison at that time and led them cap because, of course, they believed. Who wouldn't believe? So he led captivity captive because he went and preached to their spirits. He went and preached to people who had already died in the flesh. Now see, that goes against normal Christian doctrine, doesn't it? You mean you have another chance to be saved after this life? Obviously, yes. That's true. Do you think God is so unjust that he's going to send everyone to, to hell 
to eternal torment in places who never heard of Jesus. Our God is a God of justice and righteousness. That is the foundation of his throne. He would never do anything so unjust as to punish someone for not doing something that they didn't even know about. And then what about the idea of punishing someone eternally? Can you sin enough to justify eternal punishment? Do you realize that even in the law, the harshest punishment there was besides the death penalty was 40 stripes with a whip. Do you think God is going to give quadrillions of st stripes because you didn't confess that Jesus was the Lord? Is God that unjust? I don't think so. Now, taking into account Matthew 22, many are called but few are chosen. Let's begin now and look at Romans chapter 7. Do you not know, brothers, for I am, t I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. Now it's interesting here. In the example, which is a parable, like a story that Paul is giving, the woman would represent us, but in the parable it's the husband who dies. Yet, when he gets to verse 4, it's the woman who dies. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another. So here, it's not the law who died. In the parable, the woman is married to the law, and the law is very demanding. You, you do it or else. That's the law. It's very demanding. You have, to, you have to obey everything because if you mess up just one time, you fail. So, in the parable, the law, the husband died. But in reality, it wasn't the law that died. The law still exists and the law is still there. But likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law. So here, we die to the law. We are not under the law any longer. We do not have to obey all of the dictates of the law. Well, that sounds like I'm contradicting things I've said in the past, doesn't it? About living a righteous life. But it doesn't contradict. We have to understand how we live a righteous life. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our flesh is our carnal nature. Our flesh is everything we inherited from Adam, both our fallen soul 
and our bodies of, of literal flesh. While we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So spiritually, by faith, we die to the law that held us captive so that we can now serve in the new way of the Spirit. Now then, Paul goes on. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet, which means to desire. To desire things is to covet. I would not have known what it is to desire if the law had not said, you shall not desire. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of desires. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I once was alive, apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin came alive, and I died. And the very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. We have to understand that the law is holy and righteous and good. We do not derogate the law. We do not speak badly of the law because we are no longer under its jurisdiction. This is talking about a legal matter, a legal point of jurisdiction. Whose jurisdiction are you under? Are you under the law's jurisdiction by which you have to do everything or else you fail? Or are you under the jurisdiction of the Holy Spirit? This is why so many times I will take you to the end of the book to, of Revelation, chapters 21 and 22, where two times a list is made of sinful people who are kept outside of the city of God. And the reality is, you and I still will, at least from time to time, commit some of those sins. And if you just look at it that way, you say, well, we can't get in. That's right, we can't get in according to our works. We can never be good enough to get in. That's why it has to be by faith in Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus is the stumbling stone because people do not want to give up the thought that they can be good enough. They're good people. They can be good enough. No, we're not good enough. We can never make it on our own merit. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. Are you aware of what's going on in the world today? Are you aware of the things that they're doing, for example, with changing the gender of children? That is sin beyond measure. That is sin beyond my comprehension until they begin to do it. And if you look at what they do, just look up adrenochrome, for example, when you look at what people do, 
and the evil things that people do. These evil things are sinful beyond measure. Now, there are many politicians today who really work tirelessly to make every type of sin legal. Through my lifetime, I have seen one sin after another become legal. The whole idea is that they don't want any law condemning what they want to do. The law will hold you accountable, even, even the laws of men. If the right prosecutor gets involved and you commit a violation of the law, you will be punished according to the law. Now, of course, it turns out that many people who do these things are never held accountable to the law because the people who have jurisdiction over them do the same things. So we have seen, in our lifetime, we have seen sin become sinful beyond measure. And the idea is that if there were no law, if no law existed, if a law did not exist that said you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, we would not know that those things were wrong. But when the law comes in, when the law exists, the law defines what sin is. And so then we know. But then what Paul is saying here, well, we'll go on and see what he says specifically with that now. Verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. So sin becomes our taskmaster. We're sold to sin through the sin of Adam. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want. But I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Okay. Sin dwells within us. We have a body of sin. And what Paul is saying is that when the law comes, sin, seeing that the law said you shall not do this, suddenly makes your flesh want to do that. And so you find, even though you know that it's wrong to do this, 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 and this, you find that you want to do this, 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 and this. The things that you know are wrong. The things that you know are a violation of God's law. Well, that's, this happened to Paul. And this, he's talking about after he believed in Jesus. So... We're going to learn now what the answer is to this. And the answer is how a person becomes a son of God. Remember, when we believed in Jesus, he gave us the right to become children of God. So now what Paul is doing, he is now explaining in chapter 6, he told us that 
reckon yourselves dead to sin. And now he's saying, reckon yourself dead to the law. Wait a minute, I thought the law was supposed to keep me straight before God. Well, it's true. The law is a tutor leading you to Christ. And we'll, we'll read that scripture in a minute from Galatians. And that's true even after you first believe in Jesus. Because if you get off the narrow way, believe me, the law will come back and convict you. And then you'll go right back to Christ because it's the only way you can make it. So, now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another war waging another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members that is that dwells in my flesh now there are some critical clues here verse 22 for i delight in the law of god in my inner being well, i thought paul just told us that we're dead to the law. Yes, he did. However, he said the law is spiritual. And so he delights in the law of God, in his inner being, in his spirit, but not only in his spirit, because as we go on here, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind. Our mind. Our body wants to do what our mind says. No, you shouldn't do that. This is why the watching of the word is so important. Because if we fill our mind with the word of God then we are able to stand against the things that our flesh is telling us it wants to do. So I'm going to start at 21 again. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see my... But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. Now, if we just stop there, we could just say, oh, well, okay, I'll just, I love God's law, but boy, my body wants to do this and that and the other, so I'll just let it. We can't stop there. We have to go on now because chapter 8 completes his thought from chapter 7. So we have to go into chapter 8 now and, and understand this fully. And we can't stop right after verse 1 either because he says this. There is the, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. A lot of people just stop there. No condemnation, brother. I can do what I want. Okay, let's keep reading. Is that true? For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. See, our flesh could not obey the law. But by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, 
he condemned sin in the flesh. Jesus came in flesh like ours, but he did not sin in his flesh. It was like ours. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh in order to deal with sin. That's what it says here. He came in that likeness for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And here's where the rubber meets the road. Do you walk according to the flesh or according to the spirit? Let's find out what that means. For those who live according to the flat to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. This is the key. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Examine yourself. What do you think about? What are you always thinking about? Things come to your mind. Certainly certain things come to your mind. What are you thinking about? Well, the things that came to your mind, were they things of the flesh or were they things of the spirit? And setting your mind. You set your mind on something if that's what you pursue, if that's what you look at, if that's what you always go to for some type of reason. What do you set your mind on? Is your mind set on the flesh or is it set on the spirit? For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Interesting. Those who set their mind on the flesh cannot submit to God's law. And yet we're supposed to consider ourselves dead to God's law. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the Spirit, all, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now again, people can just stop reading here and think, oh, well, I've got it made. Yeah, I'm always thinking about the flesh. But this says, if the spirit of God dwells in me, then okay. Well, let's keep reading. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you, brother, he didn't say brother here, but that's who he's talking to here. For if you, brothers, live according to the flesh, you will die. You know, I, I've got 
a Bible, an old Bible somewhere, where I wrote in the Bible, OSAS and no SAS everywhere. OSAS is once saved, always saved. No SAS is not once saved, always saved. Well, see, this would be one of those not once saved, always saved, because, brother, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Well, I totally believe in what's saved, always saved, with respect to the Spirit. And I totally believe not once saved, always saved, with respect to the soul. Our souls are being saved. We are renewing our minds now. And here he is explaining how we do that by setting our minds upon the things of the Spirit and not upon the things of flesh. And then verse 14, this is Romans 8, 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. See, this, this is how you become a son. This is how you become a child of God. It's by being led of the Spirit. It's by setting our minds upon the things of the Spirit. It's by washing ourselves with the water of the Word. And that's why Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born of the Spirit and born of water in order to enter the kingdom of God. Both must occur because you can, you can believe and see the kingdom of God, but, but if you do not wash yourself with the water of the word, if you do not renew your mind, if you don't set your mind upon the things of the spirit, you can't make it in. You will die, your soul. Your soul will die. Now, the, this whole idea of dying, obviously it means that it, it doesn't, that it's, it still exists. But your soul can be dead toward God or it can be alive toward God. And if our souls are dead toward God, we will surely die. We will lose our souls. We will go into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, where we learn, where we will then learn to obey God. But I think for I think for people who who get to that point, I mean this is just what I think now I could be wrong about this. I think that for anyone who ends up going into the outer darkness, they lost that opportunity to become a child of God or a son of God. They will still live in the spirit, but they, but I, I don't think they will have that, that measure of the spirit that a son will have. I could be wrong. It could be that every single um, soul will end up becoming a son of God. That could be, could well be. We have an eternity ahead of us. Verse 14 of Romans 8, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of the placement as a son, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Well, here's another uh, no sass, not once saved, always saved, provided we suffer. How many people will not suffer for Christ? Then verse 18. 
For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager, eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The freedom of the glory of the children of God. <coughs> free because they're not under law. They're not bound by this rigid thing of do's and don'ts. They have the law of God written on their hearts and written in their minds. So all they want to do is what is right, what is true, what is lovely, what is holy. That's all they want to do. They don't need someone telling them what to do. And that's how we need to be without someone telling us what to do. We need to be led by our own spirits. And that's why we have to wash ourselves with the Word, so that we're fully conforming to the Word of God. That we walk in all of His ways by nature, but because it becomes our nature. We are then righteous. We are then holy. It's our nature. And that's what a true son becomes, someone who is holy, actually is holy, actually is righteous. And then we are free. We obtain that freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our placement as sons. Do you groan inwardly? I do. The redemption of our bodies, our bodies, our bodies, you know, our bodies are bodies of pain and bodies of sin now. Our bodies will be redeemed. They will be glorified, and they will be glorified when we pass the test, when we know that we will not use this glorified body for evil. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the Kodeshim, for the holy ones, for the saints, according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. The image of his Son. I think there's a scripture I want to bring up at this point. In the book of Hebrews,
Well, I'm not seeing it, so I'll just go on from here. We'll go back to um, Romans chapter 8. Verse 28, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Well, that's what it was in Hebrews um, chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, and bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. Well, Jesus sanctifies us. He sets us apart. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Isn't that amazing? Jesus calls us brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And this is a prophecy from Isaiah chapter 8. So, very amazing that Jesus calls us brothers. Verse 30, Romans 8, 30. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So, God will glorify the sons, and that means he will fully make them into his image. Where, because they came into agreement with the Spirit of God, they renewed their minds, their minds, their hearts became conformed to the image of Christ. They proved themselves through a life of pain and suffering in this earth, in the flesh, in bodies of sin. Bodies that tended towards sin, but through the washing of the word, through the power of the spirit, they refused to obey the sinful impulses of the body. They were enabled to do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. As long as we try to do this in our own flesh, you know, we can make a list of do's and don'ts. We will fail forever. But when God convicts us of sin, and we know that it's sin, then what we do is we, we pray, we say, Father, you know that I have a problem with this. And you know that I don't want to continue doing it. You know that I do not want to offend you. And you know that I want to live perfectly before you. God, through the Spirit then, will give you power to obey. So it's not a matter of you just gritting your teeth and bearing it and being strong enough because our flesh will still rise up at times, perhaps in anger, um, frustration, whatever it is. And we fail. We suddenly fail just through a, a momentary outburst. And when you see that, when you understand that, and you pray for God to give you what it takes by the Spirit, that's when you overcome. It's not through the flesh. It's not by the law. You can't be good enough in your flesh to get into the kingdom of God. You can only be good enough by the power of God 
And when, when you have passed the test, you will receive the crown of life. And at the appropriate time, you will receive your glorified body. And then when you receive the glorified body, you will no longer be able to sin. You will have already proven that you don't want to sin. That's really one of the reasons for this life that we have now. And I believe it's the reason why Adam fell and the reason why God intended that Adam eat of the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, so that he could learn what good and evil was, learn to discern between good and evil, and choose the good. Read Hebrews 5, especially verses 11 through 14. That's what the writer there is talking about. You should be teachers of the word now, but you mean, need milk and not solid food because you're unacquainted with the teaching about righteousness. The teaching about righteousness is that you learn to discern good and evil and choose the good. But you only do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Paul takes eight chapters in the book of Romans to teach. And then let's just finish this chapter. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? Who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who, sh who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And that's, that was a true statement then, and it is now. God's people are still persecuted and killed for righteousness' sake. But even though, even in that case, even as we see the day of the Lord come, even as we see the world move into utter darkness and chaos, Then Paul answers this, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure. Are we sure? For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, no power. not even demonic power, no ruler, no power, no ruler of the flesh can separate us from the love of God. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, fill us with this understanding so that we can truly walk by your Spirit.